A few weeks ago, Lindsay Rapp and John Best came on the show and they made fun of how stroke doctors are all over the place when deciding on aspirin or Plavix. For the purposes of the show today, I'll be using the generic name for Plavix, clopidogrel. And what they said is true. A lot of the times, residents and trainees are so confused as to which antiplatelet agent to use. Not infrequently, a resident may be presenting the case to an attending and say, I want to start the patient on aspirin. And then the attending will be like, meh, I think this patient should be on clopidogrel. Or the resident might say about another patient, you know, this patient should be on clopidogrel. And the attending will give you that evil, how could you be so ignorant stare. Why would you even suggest that, they might say. What's the evidence? Well, what is the evidence? Which drug is better? For which patient? And for how long? There's a lot to cover, and only 15 minutes to cover it, so let's just get started. This one's for you, Lindsay. Stick with us. Support for this episode of Brainwaves and the following message was brought to you by Audible, the internet's largest collection of ad-free audiobooks. If you are enjoying the episode so far, you might like to hear My Stroke of Insight by Jill Balty taylor It's the intense story of a neuroanatomist who experiences a right-sided intracranial hemorrhage and recovers to tell the tale. You can get this audiobook and listen to it in its entirety in just five hours by going to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. That's audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. One of the major take-home points for the show is to know whether you're treating an acute patient with stroke or a patient who's had a remote stroke. Acute stroke is associated with a much higher risk of early recurrence and a higher risk of hemorrhagic transformation with antithrombotic therapy. So it's not surprising that the evidence for antiplatelet agents is different, kind of based on the timing of the stroke. Aspirin is the main agent we're talking about when it comes to acute stroke. And let's start with its mechanism. As you probably know, aspirin is an irreversible cyclooxygenase inhibitor. Platelets use cyclooxygenase to make endoperoxides, and ultimately thromboxane A2, which stimulates platelet activation and aggregation. By inactivating the cyclooxygenase, aspirin effectively eliminates this mechanism of action for the entire lifespan of the platelets, about 7 to 10 days. As far as use in stroke goes, 300 milligrams of aspirin or more has level 1 evidence to support its use in the first 24 hours of acute stroke, as long as patients haven't received IVTPA. Then you'll have to wait at least 24 hours to reduce the risk of bleeding. So where does this evidence come from? The first international stroke trial, IST, was among the largest and the most recent to prove safety and efficacy of acute aspirin therapy in the prevention of early stroke recurrence. In IST, over 19,000 patients were randomized to receive unfractionated heparin, aspirin, both or neither, which is a 2 by 2 factorial design, and they were randomized within 48 hours of stroke onset. Although the primary outcome of early death by 14 days was no different between the aspirin arm versus the no aspirin arm, 14-day recurrent ischemic stroke occurred less frequently in the aspirin arm, 2.8% versus 3.9% without a significant increase in hemorrhagic stroke, a little less than 1% for both arms. The number needed to treat to prevent a recurrent stroke at 14 days was 100. A similar overall benefit for acute aspirin and ischemic stroke was observed in the Chinese acute stroke trial, CAST, which randomized over 20,000 patients to aspirin or placebo within 48 hours of stroke symptoms. However, the difference in CAST was less impressive, and the number needed to treat was about 200. Moving on to clopidogrel as an acute therapy in ischemic stroke. As you know, the mechanism of clopidogrel is unique from aspirin. Clopidogrel acts by antagonizing the ADP receptors, which prevents platelet aggregation. Now the question is, is there evidence for acute clopidogrel use in stroke? The simple answer is no, but if you read the AHA guidelines, I do reference an observational study of 20 patients who received early loading of clopidogrel and it seemed to be safe but this was only in 20 patients. So at least for now, we don't use clopidogrel alone in early stroke. But we have studied acute dual antiplatelet therapy before. In the pilot FASTER trial, patients with minor stroke or TIA within 24 hours of symptom onset were randomized to clopidogrel and aspirin or to aspirin alone, 
Although the trial was stopped prematurely due to recruitment failure, dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with a potentially important but not statistically significant reduction in 90-day stroke risk by about 3%. In 2013, the Chinese CHANCE trial reported that patients with acute minor stroke or TIA who received the dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days, followed by clopidogrel alone, this group had a lower risk of subsequent stroke than those treated with aspirin alone, an absolute risk reduction of again about 3%. So it seems that, together, aspirin and clopidogrel may be effective in tandem for minor stroke or TIA, at least during the first few weeks after the event when the risk of recurrence is the greatest. Dual antiplatelet therapy also has a role in acute symptomatic intracranial atherosclerotic disease. Given the extremely high risk of stroke recurrence in patients who suffer from this, there are several trials to talk about. The first one, COMPRESS, combination of clopidogrel and aspirin for the prevention of recurrence in acute atherothrombotic stroke study, COMPRESS, found no benefit of dual therapy over aspirin in the prevention of recurrent strokes or new ischemic lesions at 30 days in patients who had presumed large artery athro. But there's a twist here. Although the number of new strokes or recurrent ischemic lesions was about 36% in both groups, 94% of those lesions were asymptomatic, just identified on imaging. And the thresholds for what met criteria for stenosis aren't what we traditionally use. Compress investigators considered a cutoff of 30% carotid stenosis to be sufficient, whereas we typically use 50 to 70%. And intracranial stenosis was determined by the treating physician, without any central adjudication. As in Compress, chance investigators found that patients with stroke due to intracranial athro did not have a lower risk of recurrent infarct when treated with combination therapy. So you're probably asking yourself, why do we see patients being treated with dual antiplatelet therapy for symptomatic intracranial athro? It's basically because of the SAMPRAS trial. Before Sampras, we knew that the rate of recurrent stroke due to intracranial athro could be about 19% by one and a half years according to the WASID trial, or even as high as 30% by three and a half years among any patient treated with aspirin. So if even you're taking aspirin and you have this high a risk of recurrent stroke, why couldn't we just stent the intracranial vessel? Well, that's what we did in Sampras. In Sampras, nearly 500 patients were randomized to maximal medical therapy meaning aspirin plus clopidogrel, plus statin, plus blood pressure control, and so on, or maximal medical therapy and stenting. For better or worse, and perhaps surprisingly, stenting was actually associated with a significantly higher rate of recurrent stroke among all patients. By 30 days, 14.7% of stented patients had a recurrent stroke or died, whereas only 5.8% of those assigned to medical management had a stroke or died. By two and a half years, the risk of recurrence remained lower in the medical arm, at about 15%. So if you compare apples to oranges, the recurrent stroke rates between different trials like the WASID trial versus the Sampras trial, intracranial athro is associated with a 15% two and a half year risk of recurrent stroke if you treat with aspirin and clopidogrel. Or if you just use aspirin, that risk is 19% at one and a half years or 30% at three years. Either way, the risk is greater in aspirin alone. I know we can't legitimately make these comparisons. The trials are just too different and probably has to do with the potency of the newer high-dose statins and the effect of blood pressure control and adequate follow-up. But even so, nobody's going to conduct a clinical trial comparing aspirin to dual therapy for intracranial athro anymore. We simply lack the clinical equipoise. Moving on to the chronic management of patients with stroke, a lot of other agents come into play but we're going to stick with aspirin and clopidogrel for now. Beginning with the antiplatelet trialist collaboration from 1994, 287 randomized trials of antiplatelet agents for the primary and secondary prevention of vascular events were evaluated. Aspirin was the most common antiplatelet agent. Among patients from that cohort who had an acute stroke, 40,000 patients, antiplatelet use was associated with an absolute risk reduction of about 1% for MI, recurrent stroke, or vascular death, when compared to placebo. This effect was observed over an average of about half a year. The number needed to treat was about 100, similar to IST for acute aspirin use and stroke. However, among patients who had a prior stroke or TIA, 23,000 patients who received long-term antiplatelet therapy, that number needed to treat fell to about 30 over two and a half years. So 
more improvement with aspirin over time. Clopidogrel was compared to aspirin for the prevention of recurrent ischemic events in the 1996 Capri trial. Clopidogrel versus aspirin for the prevention of recurrent ischemic events. Capri randomized patients with a recent stroke, MI, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease to clopidogrel 75 mg daily or aspirin, with the primary outcome being a composite of recurrent ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, or vascular death. Clopidogrel slightly but significantly reduced the risk of the composite outcome compared to aspirin by about half a percent. The number needed to treat to prevent stroke, MI, or vascular death in this cohort was 200 when you're treating with clopidogrel over aspirin. Interestingly, in a subgroup analysis of the Capri database, if you selected only the patients who had a prior ischemic stroke or MI, the number needed to treat to prevent the composite vascular endpoint was now 29. Over the three-year study period, there was a relative risk reduction of 15% for recurrent stroke, MI, or vascular death in patients who were randomized to clopidogrel over aspirin. So if you break it down, and we're going to compare apples to oranges here again, Aspirin versus nothing in patients with stroke, the number needed to treat is about 30. But clopidogrel versus aspirin in patients with stroke or MI, the number needed to treat is also 30. And this is for patients who are on clopidogrel over aspirin. Victory for clopidogrel. Next, I'd like to ask you, what would you do if a patient has a new stroke while on aspirin? Or while on clopidogrel? Do you consider those like an aspirin or clopidogrel treatment failure? Would you switch the patient between antiplatelets at that point? Maybe consider something else like Agronox or Solostazole that we haven't even talked about? What about anticoagulating them? Certainly a patient can have a stroke or heart attack while on aspirin or clopidogrel. But when you see it, you certainly want to think about other etiologies of stroke that aspirin or clopidogrel would be insufficient at treating. Does your patient have a nasty carotid artery plaque? Do they have AFib or cancer? Or maybe they've got something more unusual like vasculitis or RCVS. If your workup is unrevealing, then maybe switching from aspirin to clopidogrel is reasonable, as long as the patient can afford it and you trust them to pay for it and take it every day. You know clopidogrel is a little more effective than aspirin for secondary stroke prevention, but would you switch clopidogrel to aspirin in a patient with a breakthrough stroke? And personally, I don't know if I would. There is a known phenomenon of clopidogrel resistance in patients who are rapid metabolizers. This is seen in maybe 5-30% to of stroke patients who receive clopidogrel, and in more than 20% of patients with myocardial infarction who undergo coronary stenting. And you can test for this resistance using a platelet function assay. But I can't say that I've ever seen anyone do this in routine practice. The next question you should be asking yourself is, is there a role for chronic dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with prior stroke? If acute dual therapy for two weeks to three months could be helpful, could it be helpful over the longer term? The answer for your average patient is no. In the MATS trial, over 7,000 patients with a recent ischemic stroke or TIA were randomized to receive clopidogrel monotherapy or the combination therapy. There was no difference in the composite endpoint of stroke, MI, vascular death, or rehospitalization for a vascular event. But there was a significant increase in the life-threatening bleeding events, 3% versus 1%. Similarly, in the CHARISMA trial, over 15,000 patients at high risk of primary or recurrent vascular events, including stroke, these patients were randomized to aspirin and clopidogrel or aspirin alone. Again, no significant reduction in the composite endpoint between the treatment arms. So for now, at least, Dual antiplatelet therapy for your run-of-the-mill stroke is not part of the AHA guidelines. So I leave you with aspirin or clopidogrel. To summarize, in the acute setting, there's no evidence supporting the use of clopidogrel as a monotherapy. But some experts have recommended acute dual therapy in a number of situations, like symptomatic intracranial athro, where three months of therapy was proven effective in the Sampras trial when compared to stenting. Or, as we saw in the Chinese trial, CHANCE, which demonstrated effectiveness of combination therapy for 21 days in patients who have a minor stroke or TIA. But, as this was a Chinese cohort with different vascular risk factors, we don't know if this effect would also be observed in Western populations. 
So the point trial, which is kind of like the Western version of chance, just closed enrollment in December 2017. And we plan to hear about these results soon, but since we haven't heard from the investigators to discontinue the treatment arms and to unblind the patients, we're kind of assuming that maybe it is a positive trial. Moving on to the chronic management of patients with prior stroke using aspirin or clopidogrel, that's where things get a little hairy. You'll probably get a different answer depending on which vascular neurologist you ask, and depending on the nuances of the clinical case. Personally, I'm a fan of clopidogrel, as you could probably tell by all the positive trials I cited. The Capri trial, which showed a relative risk reduction of 15% for recurrent stroke, MI, or vascular death. The CHANCE trial, which showed that short-term dual antiplatelet therapy followed by clopidogrel monotherapy reduced the rate of recurrent stroke and did not increase the risk of major hemorrhage. But aspirin does also have its own merits. It's unbelievably cheap, and it's over-the-counter, so patients are probably more likely to take it. We know that it works, and it's worked for decades. And as far as evidence is concerned, it's the only safe and effective acute antithrombotic agent we've got right now. And while maybe it's not as effective at preventing recurrent ischemic events when compared to clopidogrel, and we didn't talk about this today, aspirin does have a wide range of other health benefits. According to one meta-analysis of 51 randomized trials, aspirin was shown to reduce the incidence of any cancer by 25%. It reduced cancer-associated death, and it also reduced the incidence of death due to non-vascular causes. It's got a mild but significant anti-inflammatory property to it by reducing prostaglandin synthesis, and inflammation is increasingly being associated with the development of cancer and other chronic diseases. So targeting this physiologic disturbance makes a good deal of sense. But using aspirin is not exactly benign. There's plenty of data that recognizes the higher risk of major bleeding, which is approximately two-fold greater in aspirin users than aspirin non-users. Clopidogrel appears to carry an even slightly higher bleeding risk, but still not hugely concerning on a patient-to-patient basis. Or so I think. Now, knowing this information, which drug will you choose for your patient? And how will you plan to carry out that conversation? I'd love to know what your thoughts are on the matter, so just go to brainwaves.me and comment on this week's blog entry. That's all we got this week, and all I can stand to discuss on the aspirin clopidogrel debate. As always, the Brainwaves podcast is not to be used for routine clinical decision making. The episode this week was produced by me, Jim Siegler, music courtesy of William Ross Chernoff's Nomads, Steve Coombs, Rui, Little Glass Men, and Peter Rudenko on the piano. Follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at Facebook.com slash Brainwaves Audio. Thanks for listening. I'm Jim Siegler from Philadelphia, and I'll talk to you again soon.